Hey, how's it going, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Zoobox Goes to the Library. Today, Big Paul has come back. He's come back from the library, fresh from the digital library, to join me in talking about the recently released from 2021 book, Hell of a Book by Jason Mott. Hell of a Book by Jason Mott. This is a hell of a book. Hell of a book. Hell of a book. Hell of a book. And hell of a book. Entertainment Weekly is already touting this as, is already touting hell of a book as one of their heavy hitters for summer. And it's fearlessly written and constructed. And my mind is still. It, it starts off pretty funny. It's very fast paced. It's very kind of tongue in cheek humor. Um, and as you wrote in one of your answers, you've lived a lifetime as a black man in America. That's, that's how you talked about your research and experience. This book is very interesting because it is, it defies genre. As you can tell, it is a very surreal book. And this year's National Book Award for Fiction goes to hell of a book, Jason Mott! It deals a lot with black trauma and black pain. Um, as a white person, I have a lot of privilege with audacity and invention, Jason Mott's Hell of a Book weaves together three narrative strands, an unnamed author, a boy named Soot, and a figure known as The Kid, into a masterful novel. In structurally and conceptually daring examinations of art, fame, family, and being black in America, Mott somehow manages the impossible trick of being playful, insightful, and deeply moving, all at the same time. A highly original inspired work that breaks new ground. I hope I did an okay on that one. I know that I've been trying to explain it. I loved it. So good. What a hell of a read, my friend. Oh, oh hell indeed. of a book. Indeed. Hell of a book, indeed. buddy. <laughs> so, Paul, uh, this, was a Paul, this was Paul's choice. Uh, to explain yourself, Paul. I, well, before we even get started about anything, so this is something you do. You have an Audible subscription. Yes. And you often you're like a you're like a fucking caveman. You don't know what's out there. You don't know what good books are exist in the world. Uh, okay, yeah, we, that one one would say that too, or one would like to say, you know, just let fate decide. You know, I'm a big gambling guy, big gambling oh, guy, true. like a wheel of fortune. Oh, you do. Kinda... You probably get off on it. You're like, a <laughs> fuck, you probably well, get off on it, dude. So what what happens is, so I mean. I have a, a read like a bunch of sci-fi. I'm in you know the IT industry, like if you will. So a lot of my you know co colleagues, you know, the, I usually get a lot of references of you know the same things, right? I'm trying to like go through Dune. I keep intermittently go through Dune because that's like a 25 hour like you know yeah uh, commitment right there too. Yeah. And uh, uh, but I it's also read, you know just a lot of like a lot of stupid things like you know the history of bourbon and then a lot of things like you know within my industry I'm reading that. So sometimes yeah. Sometimes I like to go on the main page of Audible and just scroll up, just as scrolling right up, and then I'll just stop. And whatever my thumb lands on, I'm going to download it and I'm going to listen to it through it no matter what. And uh, the whole like thing about me too is like one it's exciting for me. I like doing stupid shit like this. I do, I do. I get a kick out of that. And too, I'm just like, well, you know, maybe well, it'll force me to read something, you know, that you I wouldn't never... have otherwise. You know, like it's a fair point. It's a fair point because you wouldn't. You, you might discover something that's really great that you never would have thought. It's like being forced to read a book in school, and you're like, well, I actually enjoy this. Right. But you wouldn't right. have chosen it anyways, right? No, no, exactly, exactly. So, I mean, that was that was a fun thing to do. Uh, and one of these days, one of these days, Sean, it will pay off. So the last time <laughs> I did it, it was like a Hello from Planet Earth, and it was a sci-fi uh, one. I was like, I did this to specifically get away from sci-fi. Yeah. <laughs> and then, but like, I feel like it was written for a teenager, but whatever. That, that's not what this is about. This is about a hell of a book. So Hell of a yeah. book. So, so you you did the scroll. You yes, land on hell of a book. Sure did. He, he sent me a message kind of like laughing. He's like, hey, I have to, I am going to listen to this. Would you want to listen to it and talk about it on goes to the library? And I was like, sure. And then I had a little thing, a little moment. I had a little problem, okay? Because I didn't have any Audible credits. Mm. And I was like, fuck, I agreed. I said I would do this. So I'm scrambling around. I'm going through other other means trying to find it. <laughs> uh, nobody's even done that. Nobody's even bothered to upload this <laughs> to sites. Mm. So Because I thought I was going to have to just read it. And then I, I found it's actually at my local library. So I was going to go and like actually just borrow the book itself the physical book 
And then I was I we was talking to Paul on Messenger or whatever on Signal, and then I was just like, fuck it. I ended up doing that three buy three credits for like thirty four dollars thing, so I could justify. I'm like, well, I'm not spending twenty dollars on this book. Mm-hmm. I'm only practically spending like eleven, twelve dollars on the book. No, that was actually the exchange because I was just going to buy it for you, and then I looked at it. I was just like, ah. Well, because you had already I'd ra- listened I'd rather, to it. I'd rather that go to uh, some lemons on D Live than uh. Yeah, yeah. That's into that stuff. sweet lemon economy. Yeah. <laughs> so I had to, uh, but then I ended up just doing it, and got through it this week. I actually finished it uh, this morning for the first time, and then probably listened to almost like half of it again today, like just in random parts, going back and revisiting stuff. Because I will say this, and I want to say this before we even start reviewing the book: listening to a book on Audible is much different experience than actually physically reading a book. Oh, sure. Um, it's a lot easier to kind of zone out and not realize that you zoned out for like 20 minutes. And then you're like, oh, fuck, what are they even, what is he, what's going on? Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That's why, oh, I gotta, should... that's why I got to listen to it like on like 205 speed, remember, because it focuses me to like listen. Does, to does it really folk? Does it help you hone in on it? Oh, yeah, it sure does. Absolutely. Well, because I listened to it on, uh, I think it was like 1.8 speed. I ended up because the guy who reads this re- is like fucking molasses man molasses yeah. on a <laughs> on a winter's night yeah uh, it's very very slow very yeah. very slow uh and i knew that because i ha- went and captured a bunch of clips from the audiobook to cut in here so i was just like holy shit yeah but they, this guy that uh, um narrates it for audible like he's an audible heavy hitter and he's got like damn near like 100 titles under his belt uh, shit this too. it's yeah, a living it's, dude it's a living no no it's a good living and like uh, to be fair though too it is it is a very soothing voice it is a nice voice it definitely... well, there's, two, there's two uh audible narrators uh uh in here but he, he's the main one for the the main uh character in yeah this, for the uh, narrator for the writer mm-hmm. um, right and, I, and again i will say this again and this is something i also want to bring up before we start talking about it because we just you know because we listen to an on audible uh, a lot of this book is supposed to be a little funny there's a lot supposed to be a lot of funny stuff i don't think that the uh the guy who read the book uh had very good comedic delivery and i thought i think sometimes some of the stuff fell flat uh because the way because of the way it was delivered rather than the actual material sometimes Mm. um at least that was the sense i was getting because i was just like because it's supposed to be kind of madcap and goofy kind of like and, contrast of that uh, the experience right like reading versus you know hearing somebody else so, like you could have nailed it in your head and your yeah. internal narration make oh that exactly. was pretty funny exactly and, you know, yeah. someone there goes now not feeling that passion in the booth not getting that timing right and then boom so, so uh, you know what if, if like that guy ever heard that he probably you know what fuck you i had to read that fucking book like seven times in its entirety <laughs> <laughs> you know actually he probably gets paid by the minute that's why he reads so slow He's yeah. like, oh, how is it? Three hundred twenty-six pages, three twenty-three. Yeah. I can make this last for ten hours. No, I, I think I, uh, I have found some article, but I think they have to read at a certain pace just for being able to have a high quality, being able to fast forward and whatnot. Actually, so you know, you certain... might have a point there because yeah. people do like to listen to things on like one point mm-hmm. five double speed nowadays, or even slower. E- even slower, you can put this down to like you know five, and then. He's like, hello. <laughs> it's like this was supposed to be a love story, and I'm like, I'm saying people, people get into that. So I, I don't know, like an ASMR kind of thing, I guess. Maybe. Something, man. You know, I had to Google ASMR when you posted that, uh, that fucking Sean versus ASMR lady. Do not do this to me. Ah. Uh, uh, uh. Oh, it's awful. It's so fucking awful. Who is this for? Oh, okay. oh! You didn't know what the term meant? No, I didn't know what the term. I find I, out so much shit about the internet, like in, like everything. Like, listen, I can't be uh, held responsible for these things. You're an adult man, <laughs> and you choose to engage. <laughs> um, oh man! All right, so just to get into it, I'm just gonna read the like little synopsis yep. here. Or do you got anything else you want? Oh to no, say? I was just gonna ask you. So, like before doing that, did you read anything else about it, or did you just no. like get the title? All right, so I did. I did the same thing. I didn't I did know anything thing about too. it. The only thing I knew is because you finished it before me, and you were laughing about having to read it, me read it, and talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> and there was even a, a brief moment where, we're like, maybe we shouldn't do this, uh, which you know remains to be seen. This may never see the light of day. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah, but I didn't know anything about it. I didn't look up any, the author, I didn't look up anything. I saw like the other books that he had written because it was like on the audible page. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, he had written um, before this The Returned, which they turned into a series, a short-lived television series about people that come back to life after they died or whatever. Yeah. Like some kind of like a resurrection type deal. Um, and then a few other books that is, are escaping me at the moment. But th- I think the only one that was like a big hit was his first book was The Returned. Yep. Like it was actually like internationally, globally, a big book. So, but this book, hell of a book, in hell of a book, an African-American author sets out on a cross-country book tour to promote his best-selling novel. That's, uh, that storyline drives Jason Mott's novel and is the scaffolding of something much larger and more urgent, since his novel also tells the story of Soot, a young black boy living in rural town in the recent past, and the kid, a possibly imaginary child who appears to the author on his tour. Throughout, these character stories build and build, and as they converge, they astonish. For while this heartbreaking and magical book entertains and is at once about family, love of parents and children, art, and money, there, there always is the tragic story of a police shooting playing over and over on the news. Who has been killed? Who is the kid? Will the author finish his book tour? And what kind of world will he leave behind? Unforgettably powerful, an electric high-wire act, Ideal for book clubs, and the book Mott says he has been writing in his head for 10 years. Hell of a book, and its final twist truly becomes its title. Wow. That kind of gives away a lot more than I expected, would expect it to. Oh, uh, it does. It does a little bit. So, so let's just give our what are your general impressions? You get you you're done. You hear that. Thank you for listening to Audible. Yeah, um, like in which star on the five line are you, are you about yeah, the yeah. you about the press, right? So, yeah. Uh, so, I, essentially, um, the, there there were parts of it that uh, I thought like well that I thought were like legitimately like enjoyable uh, for me. I'm sure we'll talk about them like you know later on as we get into it. But I think uh, overall, like the uh, the uh, the different uh, narratives like uh, trying to like intertwine. Don't believe that was as smooth as a lot of these uh, reviewers uh, like would tell you that it was. And uh, yeah, um, I think and just like in, in general, um, like I said, it's like it's a it's a very very uh, you know light read. Um, there's not going to be a time where you're sitting there like you know what what does this mean? What does this actually mean? Right. So you're not going to struggle with any literary devices here, uh, in my opinion. Uh, but I, I think I just. It's just kind of like a little, little underwhelmed, and like, uh, and some of the themes too, you know, just very topical, like in our society, which I'm sure we'll also uh, yeah, get into get into yeah. as well, and like, uh, and just kind of the way that, that was particular, just kind of left me uh, underwhelmed, and uh, at some points, uh, certain uh, kind of annoyed for uh, you know reasons I'll like get into like later. So I mean, so I would probably it probably kind of hit it as like you know a two and a half, three star. Uh, Out of five, you you go three. All right, go to three. Oh, well. well, just because you know, Sean, like you know, we're, we're artists, man. We're artists. Yeah, we're artists. It, even even if, it. even if it was crap, you know, I'll, you know, how much it took to get that crap. Out. Well, that's actually something we we were discussing briefly right before we I hit the record button. It's like we because we watched a bunch of supplemental stuff and some interviews with the author. He seems like a very nice oh guy. God. Yeah, he like seems like a super nice, cool, down to earth guy. Um, excuse me, I am. A bit overwhelmed right now, mm-hmm. and uh, <laughs> well, and he'll do an interview with anybody. I'm sure if you ask nicely, you know, you could probably get him on. It probably, I probably could honestly. I don't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't expose him to the world of Zoo Box like that. <laughs> no, because he's a nice. It wouldn't guy. go good. It wouldn't go good that. for anybody. <laughs> um. Oh, so what did I think of it? I thought it was um really kind of bad. Um. Very, I was under, I was totally underwhelmed by it. I, you know, it's the thing. It's like I don't read a lot of contemporary fiction, and I realized mm-hmm. that when I was uh, listening to the book, I was like, oh, I don't even know what the landscape is like, you know, because when you go and you read, you listen to some of the reviews and stuff, people are like, Dude, this is a revelation. This is like Kurt Vonnegut writing the Slaughterhouse Five, which is another book. It's an older, you know, kind of classic. Uh, post-apocalyptic sci-fi book that has uses a lot of literary devices a lot of literary tricks like this book does um but it's 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 written much better um so i was just kind of i was just i i I don't know if my expectations are just so askew because i don't read any contemporary fiction Hmm. like everything i the, the most current thing i've read 
like as a piece of fiction was like a Chuck Palahniuk book from like three or four years ago. Okay. Uh, Chuck Palahniuk, the author of Fight Club. Like that's like the most contemporary thing I've read because I've been reading like old sci-fi books, like uh, Philip K. Dick books. You know, after we did a Scanner Darkly, I ended up reading like four more Philip K. Dick books around that period of time. Right. Um, you know, a lot of nonfiction stuff, political stuff, historical stuff. So I'm not like accustomed to it. So I don't know what the landscape is in terms of quality of writing, but I thought this was just very straightforwardly written, like the prose itself. Right. There's not really a lot to talk about. It's very almost like basic. And almost yeah. honestly, I thought it was a little, and I hate to say this because I thought, like I said, I thought this was a very nice guy. I thought it was a little cringy. At times, yeah. like just the yeah, definitely. But just one comment. Let me uh, push on yeah. that. Like the the landscape of that too. That I would just kind of counter with that. Really shouldn't matter, you know. But, no, I agree with you. But I was yeah. I what you know I was it was that was more in reference to like why people that read a lot read mm -hmm. a lot of contemporary stuff. Why they've latched onto it is it because it's the subject matter and the way that the what the story ends up being about, or is this just like how books are written nowadays? Oh, okay. You know, because this was like basically, you could say you could. This is like at a seventh grade le reading level, maybe. Yeah, this good. Well, yeah, it's seventh grade reading level. Yeah, but I wouldn't push it out for like you know content or analysis until like I don't know freshman. No, no, because it's yeah. a, it's definitely a, an adult book. A mm -hmm. lot of adult stuff happens in it, but I'm saying just like the uh, the quality of the writing is pretty kind of lowbrow. I was which I was surprised about. Mm -hmm. And like I said, because even like, you know, like I, I referenced Chuck Palahniuk, Chuck Palahniuk, obviously explicit adult writer, but he has like a voice and a style mm -hmm. that is very identifiable as his type of writing style. And it's unique and it's interesting and it's got its own tone, its own rhythm. And this just felt very anonymous. It just like, like, uh, I don't know, just didn't feel like the author has a very strong authorial presence mm -hmm. as a writer in the way that he constructs sentences and, and the way he describes things or whatever, you know? Well, the dragon librarian would probably disagree with you. And my mind is still. Oh, I she, saw her. Yeah. Yeah. I hope you super clip dragon librarian in here right now, but as soon this is a very, you guys got to be careful with this one. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I, I think uh, they would argue that, you know, it's, you know, multi-genre. You can't fit in any other genre. Maybe that's this is what one they of his say, literary yeah. one of his literary devices uh, is to be all cloudy, especially through the uh, lens of the the narrator there. Because yes, because we have an unreliable narrator who is this mm -hmm. guy who you never find out his name for whatever reason, um, which is never really clear. Uh, maybe you can uh, elucidate something for me, because um, I think a lot of the cloudiness is actually doesn't serve much of a purpose. Like finding out why he has like a PTSD kind of why he's being really aloof about what his book's about on the book tour. If you had known that information at the beginning of the book, it doesn't actually change the book very much. No, it doesn't. And uh, what it does is just kind of change, you know, the interplay between the two uh, main storylines. Honestly, yeah. don't you think it would have been a better book if it was just more upfront? Yeah. Like if it was less of like, because it it almost like has a, a mystery structure for no reason. Like if I actually knew what happened to Soot explicitly, if I know what happens to the kid explicitly, if I know what happens to the writer explicitly, then right. I can actually like empathize, sure, and like get into their characters. Because I'll say this, having listened to it again mostly today, and I went back and listened to a lot of the the Soot's the chapters with the, with the character Soot. Mm -hmm. I kind of left me wondering. I'm like, oh, why did you just write? Because <laughs> Soot, I assume, is like an amalgamation of the writer and the kid. And that's what his second book is. Or the right. next book he's going to write is going to be the Soot story, uh, where he's going to mix his own life in with uh, this kid who got killed by the police. Yeah, That's like this ghost or whatever that's haunting him. Hey, a voice says. I turn to find a kid standing beside my table. I peg him at about 10 years old. A little gangly, meek, and nerdy looking, you might say. Like the kind of kid who spent too much time in books and not enough time grabbing life by the short and curlies. Sometimes you see kids and you just know. You can just see their entire future in their eyes. That's who this kid is. 
He's his entire future seen at a glance. But all of that is secondary to his skin. It's black. But not just black. He's impossibly dark-skinned. The darkest skin I've ever seen. It's like a clouded ocean sky in the dead of night. It's like burrowing into old caves where sunlight has never set foot. It's the kind of black that makes me think he's got to be wearing some sort of makeup. The kind of black that makes me question if what I'm seeing is real, or if I'm in the beginning stages of some kind of ocular or neurological crisis. His lips are moving, but I'm so startled by the color of his skin that I can't hear a word he's saying. What was that? I say. Can I sit here? He points to my chair and begins seating himself before I have time to give him permission. The kid has a plate of pancakes and sausage that's so much like my own, I've got to respect it. As he starts eating, I look around, trying to lay eyes on whoever it is among the rest of these fine breakfast goers that might be his parents. The last thing I want is to have some terrified parent come up to my table, screaming at me about why I'm having breakfast with her son. That kind of publicity can kill a book tour. When I can't find anybody that looks like they might be the progenitor of this dark-skinned splendor, I resign myself to having met a new friend, and I jump into the same type of banter I would offer anyone else in this world. You look like someone who's had his fair share of adventures, kid. Yeah, I guess, the kid says. He keeps his eyes on breakfast as he talks which I'm glad about because it allows me to look at the inky depths of his skin without making him feel awkward. He black. Mm. So uh, do we want to get into kind of like, you know, uh, lay out like the characters, or like the organization of it? You know, yeah, well, so the organization of the book is that it goes from, it kind of goes, one chapter is the narrator, one chapter is soot. The soot stuff is actually very minimal. I think it's probably about 30% of the book. If that, uh, yeah. uh, if that the soot chapters are very short. Uh, but I, I would say actually probably more of the more interesting things. And it actually was the story that I was way more interested in spending time with. Uh, Cause then you have the, the writer or the narrator story, which is about him. Like the description said, going on a book tour to sell his book and kind of, it's like, a, it's almost like a, at times a zany madcap wacky adventure sometimes like you know his it's, introduction is like running down a hallway yeah it's akin it's akin to like you know a rock star going on tour you know the way he <laughs> yeah. paints out this like narrator right but as you're yeah. saying you know we're introduced to him like running buck ass naked down a hallway and yeah because he's been mid, sleeping with some man's wife country. right right i'm in a hotel in the hallway i'm running no actually i'm sprinting I'm sprinting down this Midwestern hotel hallway. Did I mention that I'm naked? Because I am. Also, I'm being chased. About 15 feet behind me, also sprinting but not naked, is a very large man wielding a very large wooden coat hanger. Sometimes he holds it like a baton. Other times he holds it above his head like a battle axe. He's surprisingly fast for a man his size. The very large man with the very large coat hanger is draped in Old Navy couture, beige, straight-fit, stain-resistant khakis, argyle sweater vest, brown twill boat shoes that may or may not be faux leather. He's a family man for sure. 2.3 kids, dog named Max, cat named Princess, aquarium that's on its 12th goldfish named Lucky. He drives a Camry and lives on a cul-de-sac, in a home surrounded by a picket fence. There's an in-ground pool in the backyard. He's got a healthy 401k. He's everything a responsible adult should be. He looks to be about the same age as I am, leaving the decadent comfort of 30 and reluctantly knocking on the grizzled front door of 40. And for an instant, as the two of us sprint down this luxurious hotel hallway, feet thumping on the carpet, lungs burning, arms pumping like oil wells, I think about stopping and asking him how he built that life, how he made it all come together so perfectly, how he managed to do everything I've been unable to. I want to hear his secret. But as I take a look back over my shoulder, I see him raise that coat hanger of his into a battle axe position and shout, My wife! That's my wife! We made babies together! You 
please clear up the <laughs> cuck article you wrote? Yeah, he's been sleeping with some man's wife, and apparently the guy found out. Um, that's like you know, and then even though you spend like a ton ton of time with like his character, you learn a lot about Soot, I suppose, to a certain degree. They're so kind of ephemeral and archetypal that you don't they don't feel ever feel like real people. I never felt a connection no one, to any of them. I never felt like they were anything other than like caricatures. Yeah, uh, no character. That's one of my criticism. No character uh, in this novel is, uh, feels like it's ever been developed, and you can't really latch on to anything. And, and not only that, but in the short uh, times you're uh, experienced with most of them, uh, they're just completely character, like, you know, in, inconsistencies that it just doesn't make more sense. I think hurts more of the story in retrospect when you're trying to reflect on like what it was about than like, yeah. helping it right so at some point you know the, the haziness that the narrator is like going through because like you said unreliable narrator he struggles with what's uh, in reality you know what's not he's drunk all the time like we said he's like a rock star going through uh, on this book tour right and then uh yeah so i mean it, that's that was definitely one of my criticisms as well yeah yeah i mean like that was because it made it hard to invest it made it hard to focus on the story because so many of the characters that are introduced, like the more like kind of tangential ones, are just there to kind of be representative of part of like what African Americans have to deal with in the country and how they're treated. And part of the whole thing, they have this whole device. One of the parallels between the narrator and Soot is that Soot is taught to hide his skin, right? His father literally says, like, you need to be unseen. For three years now, his mother and father had been trying to teach him to become invisible, to become the unseen. That was the name the boy's father gave to him. He said the words with a fantastic tone. He spoke with his hands in the air, sweeping back and forth gently like he was playing some magical instrument. You will become the unseen, the boy's father said. He added an almost spooky, oh, um, and then when we were <laughs> introduced to the narrator, he's naked the first time. Yeah. Like there's, and they do a lot of that kind of stuff where they try to draw these kind of loose illusions between the life of soot and the narrator's experience and the narrator's like, and, a, Oh, I'm sorry. And they do that so much because like the big reveal, I don't know if we're going to a spoiler alert. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, go yeah ahead. But, like the big reveal is that soot is actually you know the narrator in there so you do end up getting his name at the end of it you know well at least his nickname from childhood was a uh, suit but there's so many references between uh his father's life um uh his uh grandfather you know daddy henry everything where they uh, just things that they call in so the mer narrator's main vice to escape or get, uh, get away from reality is trying to act like a hum humphrey bogart character right so i put on my best bogart brogue and i give it to her right down the middle Nice set of pillars you're standing on. All yes. this fast paced talking, you know, which was so <laughs> just very, very, very hip African American of the modern era. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I don't know, man, but it was, it, it was annoying to hear, right? But then you hear that, like in the soot chapter with, you know, his dad talking about that. Hey, doll face, you know, hey, no, I, no, I, no, well, this is, see, I got a different takeaway from the end. I thought the soot chapters were a mix of, this this kid who gets killed by the police that's like haunting him or he sees he manifests because mm -hmm. there's this whole thing at the end of the book where he's like on a talk show and he has kind of a a break with reality or something and he thinks he's talking to this dead uh, the dead kid's mother in this like studio of a talk show and the dead kid's like I want you to tell my story like tell my story mm -hmm. that's why I, that's what I want you to do which is his conscious like his subconscious telling him that he needs to write about the black experience because there's even a moment in the book where like one of his agents or whatever is telling him, uh, Oh, you can't write black characters, which echoes the grandfather sentiment. Like nobody wants to hear that stuff. Nobody wants to buy that. Nobody wants to be bothered by that. Uh, so it's him coming to terms with his blackness. So I thought like the soot thing was a, a, an amalgamation. Like when you're reading the soot chapters, you're actually reading the author's follow-up book because there are things, because I don't think that, um, I mean, I could be wrong. Maybe I missed something or I, but that's what it kind of read to me at the end during the, like kind of the big reveal. Cause obviously it goes way heavier 
on being explicit, like, well, Soot needed medication, and Soot was a writer, and he would escape into fantasy worlds because he wanted his dad to be alive because his dad was also a victim yeah. of police violence. And um, and so was – but but Soot was also – wasn't he also a victim of police violence? Yeah, with his uh, Uncle Paul uh, in there. And not, uh, like, violence per se, but at least, you know, uh, Well, because does, doesn't the story, the story of the kid and the story of Soot merge at the end of the book? Because they're talking about Soot getting shot. And how his parents, all his parents ever wanted to do was protect him from this world. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I see what you're saying. You know what I'm saying? So I thought, like, and I think it was intentionally done where he's starting to mix those two things. Like, the farther you go into the book, the more explicit they are about the kid's story. Right, right. Um, was that they started? he started kind of mixing those things a little bit. Which yeah. is honestly probably the most interesting part of the book. The, the interplay between those. Yeah. Well, I actually was kind of invested to a certain degree into the, the Soot story. I didn't really care about the narrator at all in right. terms of the way he, the, the way the story that was being told with him in the current time. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. So you talk about like the, the, the suit character architect, right? So you just kind of, you get introduced to him through like like we said like there's a lot of interplay between chapters keep going back and forth between the narrator who's not named uh and then the suit right and then uh you kind of go through this whole thing with uh you know what you said off earlier you know the, the trick the the yeah um, the game they played at age five was you know to pretend to be invisible right and then as he goes through those rise like age the next time you pick up with the like suit is at age 10 where you know he's getting picked on um on the bus for uh, the color of his skin uh, by other by black own, yeah by yeah. and by his cousin too uh being yeah. one of them uh, i think it's tyrone in the, in the novel yes, right it's tyrone. and the reason why they call him suit is obviously like you know chimney you know he, he was chimney uh, that suit, dark. yeah mm -hmm. yeah but you ain't just black nigga you extra black like i bet you sweat coffee the first snicker rippled through the kids on the bus i mean why you steal all the darkness? Why you so stingy? More laughter. A few rows away, a girl yelped out a high-pitched laugh. Nigga, your mama must have been blind, and she wanted you to look like what she saw. Nigga, I bet when you get out of the car, your daddy's oil light come on. The Snickers turned to giggles, turned to belly laughs. The entire bus was in on the fun now. He black. And they go there and it kind of falls down too. So what about the, like the narrator's arc, right? So like every, everything about this, like you get introduced to him, like running, uh, he's running naked from, you know, uh, sleep on someone's wife and he runs into an elevator and then immediately thinks as he gets into the elevator, uh, you know, <laughs> this old lady like basically saves him. She opens, saves the elevator door open for him so he can get in there in time before the guy catches him. So he's butt ass naked going down the elevator talking to this old lady and uh and then uh, this is the first time they reference this and this will happen like throughout the rest of the book did you hear that that boy did you hear about that boy yeah all right and it goes on so it's like subconsciously getting you at the beginning or well not subconsciously it's like planted right there like uh like in the beginning it is in your face and then he and he moves back on to like the character which you find out is is like a, a defense mechanism of living in this kind of blur of blurred uh reality right and as he's going down there and then just saying like i have no idea what he, she's talking about what kid and i'm sure there's like another one but i just you know nod my head and said damn shame because that's what a good person does and it just his right off the bat he does paint out like this great lack of understanding of like reality right so like so you already see he's like more so if you worried about what's a good person then why are you naked in the first place running down the hall, right? And then you, you go well, they, I think it almost presents him as a narcissist and a sociopath, except mm -hmm. uh, the way they explain it away, it's like, oh, his mother his mother died, and that really affected him in a big way. Yeah. Because <laughs> he, you know, I don't see this is the thing, like it's uh and I, I listened to some interviews and he did not have this completely planned out. He actually mm -hmm. the first draft of this book does is just about the book tour it's just a goofy comedy yeah about being on his it was like kind of a semi-autobiographical about him on his first book tour right and then um and then it just sat on a shelf forever and he would go back to it every once in a while and then during quarantine he finishes the book which i think is where we get the socio-political angle 
and he, yeah. I think he, he added all that stuff in there yeah, to, yeah. to change the book. But I, the book just feels like it's really all over the place, like tonally. And I understand that some of that was his intention mm-hmm. uh, was to have, but I just don't think it worked very well most of the time. Like you get yeah. like real, some s- real tone whiplash sure. like constantly. Um, and I don't, it just didn't work for me very well at all. Like where you have like guys like um, having a slap fight because he's too drunk to go into this this book reading he's supposed to do, and then a BLM protest busts through the middle of the street. Our own slapstick chaos is broken up by a chaos of another sort. Down the street, Rennie and I both hear a maelstrom of voices rising and falling in rhythm. The air around us suddenly feels 10 degrees warmer, as if whatever's coming is sending energy out in front of itself. It's the type of thing that you wouldn't think could be real, but it is. I know it's real because I can see it in Rennie's face. He's looking in the direction of the sound, with just as much confusion as I feel. And not only is he confused, my friend Rennie looks a little scared. Something's coming. Something epic and important and potentially terrifying, potentially life-changing. I can feel it in my stomach. Or that could just be the vodka. But no, turns out it's not the alcohol. Little more than a block away, a wall of people suddenly emerges from a neighboring street. They carry signs and banners. They shout and chant and punch fists at the overcast sky as though it's done something to offend or condemn them. They're all kids. Not a single adult mixed in among the bunch. The oldest among the mass looks like he just walked away from 16 last week. The youngest is in diapers and still sucking on an insulated bottle. But regardless of their age or wardrobe, they're a force to be reckoned with. And then we spend 20 minutes talking about BLM. Yeah. And then they go back to having a slap fight. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's not balanced very well. And he couldn't find the comedy, like the absurdity in what was happening to him at that moment was not like incorporated into the story very well, like organically. Like right. if you have a, you have a drunk guy who's like vomiting all over himself and his, his, his handler has to slap him around to get him to, to wake up. And they just stand and watch this protest walk by and yeah. be very observant and very like respectful. Mm-hmm. Like there wasn't a way we could have incorporated into this, into some of his denial, his self-destruction. You know what I'm saying? Like, cause if yeah. the book is about yeah. identity, about accepting who you are, accepting your trauma and your pain and your lot in life to a certain degree so that you can actually move on from it. Um, those things were not like incorporated in a way that felt meaningful at all. No, no. Uh, only in the most cheap, like kind of cynical way. Like that's what I mean. It's very like surface level. It's like it's like he he was you know obviously aware of current events and what was going on, mm-hmm. and he even name drops. I mean, even George Floyd is mentioned in the book. They hold up poster board photographs of Emmett Till and Tamir Rice, Michael Brown, Philando Castile, George Floyd, and all the other names that will be added to America's list between the time I write this and the time you read this. So it just doesn't seem like it was just a very, like he didn't have a good idea of what he was almost ultimately trying to express. Cause it just seems there to be like, like I said, like cynically, emotionally manip- manipulative mm-hmm. in a way that I think when you see the response of like some of the people that have really been heaping praise on it, it's almost feels like, and I hate to say this, it almost feels like the subject matter is just something that you really can't criticize. Yeah. Just because it's in there. No, for sure. I, I would say on a side note, the uh, the most fun uh, part of this was looking up uh, reviews and videos of people talking about it uh, for that same reason. Which but is crazy. I, this is a New York Times bestseller, I believe. Mm-hmm. It's won a few awards. Yep. And... Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I, like it's, he was on the Today Show. If you go to, the, to the, the, the Today Show's official YouTube page, like 7 million subscribers, the interview they do to promote this book has like 2,000 views. Oh, wow. Like nobody's talking, nobody's talking about it except for these few people. And if you find those other reviews, they're like, you know, they're doing solid zoo box numbers, 30, yeah. 90. <laughs> so. Yeah. 
Yeah, but I, I didn't want to like side like track too too much like off of that. But it just the the main narrator's arc, I think, is what like um, frustrated me the most about that because there was definitely I felt like a lot of potential to do something with that. Um, oh, just with that that setup, right? I mean, you could say that about anything that you don't like. You know, there's potential to go somewhere else, right? But I just think, in particular, you know, uh, like I like that idea of you know a rock star, but it's like a book tour and like a losing grip of reality, kind of like you know fear and loathing type of yeah. thing you know like i like i i, I uh, generally that's something i would generally be really really interested it's like in a, it's like fight club for social justice and, and you know and that's that's so many like it's hints pedantic, of that too, it's right? pedantic to say that but i mean yeah it is. Kind of uh, no no but you're, you're not wrong because uh like the main narrator is, it, his whole story as part of this novel is essentially an allegory for becoming woke and mm-hmm. it does it in the most anticlimactic way like the entire novel you're reading for something to happen and then nothing does and then uh and the thing when you get to the point you know the parts of the novel that were you know was the event so to speak there was already so much on the nose like uh sometimes like leading up to it that you're just oh okay like case in point like you know the the denver interview right but it was and like that was about (laughs) that I think the most exciting it got was uh, right from his introduction and like running down the hallway naked. So. <laughs> well, that's what I mean. Like, like you said, there is kind of, you see the potential and you see how things could, it's like maybe he needed like another, like another two or three drafts or something. Mm. Uh, Cause it just feels a lot of that stuff feels shoehorned in there. Like I said, it's not, it's not delved into very deeply at all. Right. Like, I'm sorry, but like, if you're telling a story and you're like, Hey, feel bad that a kid got shot by a cop. Like, hey, no problem. I can feel mm-hmm. bad that a kid got shot by a cop. Don't you worry. Right. <laughs> but I don't know anything about this kid. I don't know anything about what happened, what's going on, what's the larger context. And then you see, and he goes throughout the book, because uh, a lot of the characters, like I had said before, kind of serve the purpose of like giving him some sort of barrier to overcome, All some right. sort of dilemma, some sort of thing to show him why he's like low key being microaggressed against all the time. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, obviously one of the most egregious ones would be like the agent who's like, don't write black stories. Which Jack. I think. I yeah. Think Jack, Jack, the media, Jack tra- the media trainer. One last thing though. What's that? This probably goes without saying, but I'm going to say it anyway. Don't write about race. Specifically. Don't write about being black. You can write about black characters, but just don't write about being black. No. Why not? Trust me on this. I've crunched the numbers. I've seen a dozen writers like you come and go. You've got that crossover talent, my man. You live in both worlds. That's the smartest thing about Hell of a Book. You need to hang on to that. The last thing people really want to hear about is being black. Being black's a curse, no offense, and nobody wants to feel cursed when they read something they just finished paying $24.95 for. Know what I mean? Here's one thing I've learned. When someone treats you terribly, the last thing they want is for you to behave as if they've treated you terribly. If I punch you in the neck, I don't want you bringing up that time I punched you in the neck. It's your job as the punchy to grin and bear it and treat me like I never did it. Make me feel good. Help me forget the whole neck-punching adventure. It's common courtesy, really. And that's just the same for the person who said they loved you and then showed it not to be true as it is for the country that kidnapped you and chopped off your left foot. Nobody wants their monstrosities brought up. And if you should happen to do it, they'll hate you for it. Just ask Frankenstein's monster. Say what? Yeah. Like no, no, don't, absolutely. People don't want to hear this stuff, and then he does that word salad of just like vomiting out like all of these, uh, all of these like woke terms. The future of this country is all about patriotic, unity-inducing language, post-racial, trans Jim Crow, epitraumatic, alt-reparational, omni-restitutional, jingoistic, body positive, socio-cultural, transcendental, indigenous, repostic, treaty of Fort Laramie perpendicular, meta-exculpatory, pan-political, uber-intermutual, MLK-adjacent, demi-Arcadian bucolic. 
That is the vernacular of the inclusive, hyphenated, bo-American destiny we're manifesting here, you and me. Book by book, we're making it happen. But it doesn't happen by planting flags and picking at the scabbed over wounds of a certain dispossessed neo-global cultural demographic committed at the hands of a one-time, possibly improprietous proto-nation. It's such a beautiful word, Soup, he's feeding me. Simply beautiful. Mm-hmm. Hey, well, too, and like, uh, so what uh, What I said earlier about, you know, the uh, the inconsistencies, that, like, in the characters, too, just the double. So Jack, the media trainer, is, like, a great point, and then his publicist, uh, Linda, in there, right? So, like, uh, let's hang on, hang on this one here for a second. So uh, when they're getting... Um, his publisher is getting Jack the media trainer in here. They're doing this to gear up, you know, for interviews to step up. The sales are doing great and everything in there, you know, because they annoyingly talk about some random statistic about what affects, you know, book sales or whatnot. Yeah. And then, um, so when Jack the media tra uh, trainer meets uh, the narrator uh, for the first time, he's like, oh, you didn't tell me you're black. And then Linda goes, well, I wanted to see if you'd be able to tell. I couldn't. Oh, this is great. And he goes, why does that matter? He's like, oh, and then he goes into this whole thing that don't, don't do this, right? And then uh, Linda's comment to that when the narrator says, "Why does that matter?" She goes, "See what I'm look working with here, Jack. Like this, you know, you know yeah. the the quiet thing that you're not supposed to say out loud, right? But they said out loud in this whole thing, like, oh, you don't do this, right?' And then, like you said, the word salad of here's why you know you don't do that, right? And you know this is yeah. this will hurt cells and blah blah and this this and that and 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 the other, but what happens like like later on so after they go this whole thing about yeah you know don't no, don't talk about that then all of a sudden the linda the publicist you know here's about another story and she's just so shook and disturbed like how is this going to happen then jack the media trainer's like oh my god when, when is this going to happen so it's gone this like quick quip about like gun violence like what do we even need guns for you know oh blah, blah, blah. And then, like it's just so like like really because you just painted them off as like you know these cold heartless like get to the point about cells and all of a sudden now you're going to now really like they give a shit they give a shit the only thing i would make it where like if you comment on this this would improve sales like i would have appreciated that more than like you know how it well did. i think it's it probably just... it's probably there i guess if i was were to be charitable is to say about like the folks the, the faux sincerity people have about the struggle of the black community because mm -hmm. they'll virtue signal about gun violence while at the same on the same in the same sentence also be like well don't pre don't present black Mm. Don't present black. Which, you know, by the way, Jason Mott, <laughs> he's a very, he's a very straight laced dude. Like he's mm -hmm. not like a, um, I don't know what you'd call it. Like he's not, uh, he's not very urban. And I'm not saying that as like a negative or anything, but relative to what they're talking about in the book, and who he is as an author and as a right. person, how he presents himself. Um, right. It's it's just like a well, I guess I don't know. I guess maybe that is the thing with those characters that you can just it, you, you can just be like well, even though he's like that, even though he's so straight laced, he's like you know white for you know white presenting whatever you want to call it. I think even a great they like, would a still great way be to like, about relate this to is that movie. I I'm um, sorry to bother you, right? When you go in the Danny actually, Glover. dude, I thought about that movie a lot while reading mm -hmm. this because the pace and the style and the tone. Mm -hmm. Seemed like he was trying to do that with the, when you were, especially when you were spending time with the narrator. Yeah, exactly. So I felt that was like their uh, like, here's your white voice like scene, right? Yes. Like, like yeah. with that. The problem with that is you know it's like well it was already done before and and I want at least it was you know some somewhat funny and like David I, hate, I hated that fucking Pat, movie. Pat and Oswald like do, doing their voices whatnot. I hate that movie. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> commie, commie gobbledygook. No offense, but it sounds like some fucking commie gobbledygook. <sighs> That's what oh. that fucking movie was. It's like, it's a like, oh, all of his friends hate him because he decided to like try at work. Mm -hmm. Ridiculous. No, but anyways. No, was, no, <laughs> for another time. But I, I was in that for that animal passion, so. <laughs> oh, yeah. I bet you were, yeah. Boy, Army Hammer. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, buddy. Yeah, buddy. But yeah, no, I mean, that was that was just bad. And then what was it? The other character, too, uh, it was just, it was like Rennie, which was his handler, like uh, when he got to one of those states, right? He, he just described them as like, what, what was that famous uh, uh, Asian actor, Johnny Wong? He said it looked like Johnny Wong yeah, or whatnot. And then apparently he went to Harvard and used to ride in limos, but now he drives them. And uh, that was never explained. Um, there's like a subtle hint that 
uh, this guy is like well off. Um, yeah, because he lives in a mansion. There's not even a subtle hint. He could, they go to his house. Right, right. Well, yeah, but uh, like, there's nothing ever there. And then the like, guy, you know, and all of a sudden, like Rennie has, like, cause he's the one like slapping him, like what you're referencing earlier. Like, yeah, ready to go to the next area. And then they see, um, you know, there's uh, protesters going by. And then he gets all, like, you're going to tell me the guy, like, you described as Johnny Wong, and, like, you know, like this businessman, whatever, is going to have like strong feelings about, you need to go out there and talk about the black condition, which, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it, it was just like, I don't know. Well, that's it why, like, a lot of it just doesn't read as very, like, uh, credible. It just seems mm. very contrived, right? Like, it's it's Everything. off it's author insert stuff where it's just yeah. like, well, I'm I need somebody. Fan. I'm not a fan of, like, trying to use, like, straw man, like, arguments. Every time. Oh. And every time there was a, I already know what that, what that yeah. O is going for. But every time that there's, like, a, you know, a contrast or something to his, like, inner thoughts, like, coming to terms with, you know, like, uh, what the narrator says, you know, his blackness or, you know, like, what's happening on, like, in the world. Every op- opposing thought of that is just the most, like, stereotypical, like, just like like I said, like a freaking straw man. And, yeah. and just also made, like, insincere, too. It's just, like, you're not looking to persuade anything it, well if you are you, you're failing you know badly because you're well it's because it's made for people that already agree with whatever like the general s- sentiment is right right that's what it's that's what it is like it's about like well you know you're reading this book you're probably you're probably like a woke cool person sure. i don't need to i don't need to talk about the politics of any of this stuff i just have to present it and you're like yeah that's true of course that's true mm-hmm. I, I guess the most <laughs> egregious straw man was the uh was the the ex cop mm-hmm. that he talks to towards the end of the book? Yeah. Um, and where he is just like this ball of stereotypes of like uh, angry, impotent white men. Don't pretend you don't know why. Don't pretend like you ain't never had the thought. Don't pretend like you don't sit around sometimes being angry, chewing your cud like my daddy used to say over everything that's been done in this country to people like you, people like me black people you're angry and why shouldn't you be but the thing about it is i didn't do it i didn't do any of it i wasn't born when all of that slavery shit happened i wasn't even a twinkle in somebody's eye and you you weren't never a slave you weren't never nobody's property me and you we went to the same school grew up just as broke We live the same life, but I get to carry around all of the guilt. I get to be called an oppressor. I get to be told about how everything my ancestors did was terrible. Well, how do I know? How do you know? Wasn't neither of us there? Not you nor me. So how you know that my folks owned slaves? How do you know that my folks had anything to do with hurting and harming your folks? And yet you still want to blame me for it. You want to blame me just because you're angry about stuff that you can't control. I ain't gonna sit here and say that your people ain't had a bad shake. I won't say that. But they're all dead. All the ones that it happened to, they're all gone. And now everything's fair. Everybody's got a chance at things. Mm-hmm. Type feelings. He even says to him at one point, I was just angry. Yeah, maybe I was angry when I shot that kid. Maybe I was angry because uh, you people have everything that I was supposed to have that was supposed to be promised to my people. So, yeah, maybe I was a little mad when I came across that boy. I saw him, and I saw people like you, people that got to have the things that were supposed to be promised to me. And you're like, what the fuck? What the fuck are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> like, this is a... Uh... This is odd. The, <laughs> and it's just there to make a point. It's not there to be realistic. And I guess, you know, if if he wanted to, as a defense, I'm sure the author could be like, yeah, it's surreal. Like, it's magical. It's like mm-hmm. he's going on an odyssey, a magical odyssey. It's not really, it's like fear and loathing in Las Vegas. Some of the stuff is metaphor. And and like we said earlier, like the, the narrator is unreliable. So who knows if these are really happening or are these are just thoughts in his head, like the, the conversations he's having with himself. Um. Yeah, and I would get, and uh, I really like would back that up if there was like some type of I don't know like profound like outbreak, right? Because how, 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 how does the story like? And you know, just, uh, keep in mind first and foremost, this is supposed to be a love story, and you know, and so like there's everything about it was just like 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 you said earlier, just kind of like cringe, and then just a lot of uh, despair, right? 
so uh like we, we said like the the uh, jason mott um you know is nice of a guy as he like he seemed at least like yeah. all the interviews and everything it just like it looked like a cool guy actually i'm trying to go pull up uh, some of his uh, i guess he wrote a, a lot of poetry as well yeah in addition to the novels when i want to i'm curious uh, to go like check some of those things out but uh oh where the fuck was i going with this you see hell of a buck man hell of a war one man it gets me gets me all out of sorts gets me all out of sorts but as it ends though like despair is like one of the like main themes like whether it's uh the preacher he sees talk you know uh when it, he's doing the uh, inner narration for you know um so it's father right um i think the the uncle paul like character in there mm -hmm. huge huge like uh care of that and then um uh, like everything you know it's just like despair and leaning so there's no like there's no like positive message. Well, no, there isn't one. because like when I mean, he starts to come to terms with the fact that he's black, right? That he's mm -hmm. a black writer, and that should mean something to his work, because an uh, you know a writer, an artist, they should be speaking themselves, like their lives. They're representing sure. something of themselves in their art, and by not representing your blackness, then you're uh, you're being inauthentic. But they, when you think that the book should be kind of coming to some sort of conclusion or crescendo and when he starts coming to these conclusions about you know his blackness or whatever you want to call it uh then the book is just like yeah you know there's nothing you do you're black you're always going to be a victim like they literally like just say that there's like a yeah. monologue we're mm -hmm. actually i think the dragon librarian lady read it in her review oh yeah 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 happy no i'm not sure black people can be happy in this world there's just too much of a backstory of sadness that's always clawing at their heels. And no matter how hard you try to outrun it, life always comes through with those reminders letting you know that, more than anything, you're just a part of an exploited people and a denied destiny. And all you can do is hate your past and, by proxy, hate yourself. Being who we are, it's hard. We get shot or put in jail. It's all we see. It's all we know. Our whole story is about pain and loss, slavery and oppression. It defines us. It seeps into our skin. We bleed it even as we're covered by it. All we want is to be something other than the pain that we have been born into. All we want is to be known for something else. We want the great history we see in others. And all we're ever given is the story of being in pain and being forced to overcome. Where it's just like buzzword, 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 mm -hmm. buzzword about just you are a victim. There's right. no escaping that. You're just born a victim. There is no real way out of it. Uh, I don't like that's the thing. I don't even know what the fuck the point of the end of the book is other than just like, yeah, be who you are and have, be your authentic self. Right. And again, you listen to like interviews with you know Jason Mott out there, and he says like you know who's this intended reader for, right? It's like anyone that's you know get tired of the news and seen like these types of killings or wants to know how to. Uh, I think he said wants to know how to like interact with BLM or what they're all about, which uh, was really really interesting to me because <laughs> like I don't think he knows what BLM is all about, right? So like you and I agree, BLM as a sentiment, yes, understand. Like hundred percent, yeah. But BLM as an organization, right? I think they would have a lot to say about you know Soot's nuclear family. Well, this right? is what I'm saying. Well, this like, is what I'm saying about like the depth of the, the right. argumentation is that it's not there because he's just like, well, I mean, I'm sure this is not a conscious thing. I'm sure he wasn't just being flippant about it. But like, oh, I'll just I'll include it there, and people will just agree with it. People yeah. will just not not think anything of it. And they'll just be like, "Oh yeah, this is a very serious, solemn moment, isn't this, this so really, interesting?" All, all the all, uh, all the woke aspects of this, um, and I hate like that. I know that term, or I use it. I'm using it now, but like all the woke aspects of this in this novel, like to me, seem as, as somebody that took a stab at you know doing some writing, you know, one time before, but yeah, just seemed like a complete afterthought. Everything. Kind Everything of there just seemed like an afterthought. You, like, when I do this, when I found out that he had written a draft of this that was just the book tour stuff, I was like, "Oh, that makes a lot of mm -hmm. that makes way more sense." Mm -hmm. I suddenly kind of a lot of it clicked with me that I was just like, "Oh, yeah, yeah that it does. It feels like you you have grafted other things onto a different book." Yeah, and yeah. and like the other uh, the critique I have too is just like it, 
like if he dialed back a lot, like because you could, I still think like uh, with even if it came across as like an afterthought, if that's how you wanted to do it. I think if you made it even more subtle and less on the nose, it'd be more powerful or something to reflect of course. To on, just like anything else, right? But it, the fact that it's just it gets all spelled out and like yeah, uh, before you do it, and it's just, I know we we've talked about this before uh, in movie reviews and stuff. There's nothing I dislike more than when mm -hmm. the subtext is just told to you. Mm -hmm. just in let this it lie. case it's not told to you it's just slapped to you in the face if you're reading it then it's going to get slapped on your face just like jack media uh jack the media trainers uh word soup right so <laughs> yeah yeah know, um so should we talk let's talk about uh soot and his family soot and his family Mm -hmm. What did you think of the soot sections? Did you find those like engaging, interesting? Because I thought, like in my in my opinion, I was like, well, there's actually something here. Mm -hmm. well, cool. No, I thought that at the beginning, uh, I, I thought he wrote a uh, very like warm, uh, nice descriptive of uh, Suit's father. I think yeah. it was nice. I was le like legitimate, like laughing. I was like, ah, oh, find another uh, little ankle biters, you know. I mean, it was just like you know, typical like dad shit, whatever. I thought that that was nice. Uh, I am in kind of. I agree with you too. I was more drawn towards that suit subline, but that's you know, really. but I think cool. uh, I think that uh, that part uh, suits like you know tragedy, uh, ongoing tragedy, like what's happening uh, with his father, and then you know um, his angry uncle coming in to help him and get mm -hmm. him exposed to situations because like he's like is he's <laughs> as it says right there like you know, I'm going to give you a gun. I think he's like 12 at this point. Yes, uh, when his yeah, father when his, dies, and then, yeah, when his father dies, you yeah. know, and then his uncle is going to get like, here's a gun, you're going. To need. I'm like, well, because the like, whole thing is about like that side of the story, mm -hmm. which is I know that's also what he's trying to draw parallels uh, to in the narrator's story as well. It's about like intergenerational trauma and how other generations have dealt with being black, right? Mm -hmm. Like you know, it goes from the grandfather, the uncle, the sure. father, and there's a lot of actual substance to their relationships that's inferred. By their interactions like as kind of ham-fisted as it was like the scene where uh you know soot's father or jimmy i think right is jimmy is his name jimmy jimmy decides basically like really? well i'm never going to talk to my father again and you're never going to see my son again because you're yep. you're a poison person basically i need you to be happy the way your daddy used to be boy i need to know that you won't fall apart and give up on things like he did Daddy Henry's eyes flitted from his son to his grandson. I'm trying to help, he said, staring at Soot. I hear you like stories, Daddy Henry said. That's good. There's a future in that. You should take up writing. But you gotta tell the right stories. You gotta tell them the right way. No nigger stories, okay? You gotta do it right. His face contorted with each word. It transformed from worried to angered, to pleading, until it finally settled on a type of sad resignation. Please, he said, let me help him. Please. Say goodbye, Soot's father said. Goodbye, Daddy Henry, Soot said. With tears running down his face, Daddy Henry made a move to get up out of the chair, but his legs failed him. He pulled with his arms at the edges of the chair, trying to pull himself free of the prison that was his body. But that failed as well. As he left, Soot watched the old man continue to struggle against the weight of his infirmity. He raged and fought, but remained pinned by gravity to his chair. And uh, to learn a little bit about why uh, Jimmy's father feels the way he does about himself, about being black, about the whole thing about being unseen, all of this stuff is obviously from the influence of his grandfather because he he just took the most like negative thing he could from what is what the grandfather or what his father was saying to him. Mm -hmm. uh, there was actually some interesting stuff there, and it was in the subtext. Yeah, I mean it's obvious, but it's at least it was in the subtext, and there's interesting there, right? there's interesting things to actually like kind of latch onto emotionally, and things that you can understand. Sure. Like it's really hard to empathize with a fucking like sociopath like writer bouncing around <laughs> the country mm -hmm. being depressed and and not having anything interesting other than he's just being fucking depressed. Yeah, being depressed, uh went on a couple dates and then found Boss Kelly. Because that was this thing, right? Yeah, every yeah. girl his name was Kelly, and then there's one 
and it's just like a mortician or some shit. But anyways, but 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 yeah. back on back on back on Seth though, like that's a love uh, story. Uh, yeah, no, it's a, it's a love <laughs> story. But the uh, <laughs> another another goddamn afterthought. Uh, the uh, uh, dad uh, was it? Fuck, you know, Daddy Henry. Yeah, Daddy Henry, his, his yeah. grandfather, right? Like, so I was talking about Strawman earlier, like with the ex-cop. Uh, there's another like, Strawman thing, like with a cop that confronts uh, suits Uncle Paul. But then, what yeah. about Daddy Henry, though? Man, that was like the most Uncle Ruckus. Character. Uncle Ruckus, or it's kind of like uh, <laughs> Uncle Ruckus or Bernie Mac from uh, "Don't Be a Menace" in uh, <laughs> South Central yeah. while jer- drinking your juice in the hood. <laughs> Hate you, black bastards. You stink. I hate your black skin. I hate your black pants. I hate black pepper. I hate black keys on the piano. I hate my gums because they black. I hate Whoopi Goldberg's lips. I hate the back of Forrest Whitaker's neck. <laughs> and most of all, I hate that black ass Wesley Snipes. Yeah, yeah, just totally like you draw them white people. You draw them white people. Yeah, You're good at it. You make that money. <laughs> you see this? You see this? Isn't this the most beautiful white woman you ever seen drawn? Ever. Like ever. it laid it on very thick. But <laughs> there are pe- there there are people that are like that too, though. You yeah. know, and the reason actually I, it reminded me a ton. I don't know if you've ever seen it, and I was like, oh, you kind of it feels like you kind of stole some of this from uh, August Wilson. Uh, have you ever seen Fences? Denzel Washington. Oh, no, no, no. That's I, I've always been. This, that's one of the ones that's on the yeah. queue. Never, never got. Yeah, Denzel that. Washington made a movie out of this famous play by August Wilson called Fences, and the the father son dynamics, the family dynamics of the soot stuff, is very much reminded me, very reminiscent of uh, of Fences, because it's all about this, uh, you know, fathers feeling the failures of their life feeling stuck trying to get their sons to not do that but also wanting their sons to achieve the dreams that they never accomplished and the kind of rage that that can make a person feel and how that can get all fucked up right Mm -hmm. and uh and i thought that kind of stuff was uh in those sections of the book um and that that was the stuff that i was the most engaged by just even in a vacuum even if i had just read the story as like a short story yeah i probably i would have walked away being like oh that was pretty that was it was interesting, you know. There, yeah. That was that was all right. Yeah, no. There's there's worse things to you know spend your time read it right. But, yeah, but uh, what you what did the but back on uh, uh the the narrator like did anything do it for you like that whole like main through line? Dude, I didn't. Well, I didn't. I just didn't know him because like we've talked about before they they use his life as like this onion you're supposed to be unpeeling and learning these new little bit by bit you learn little new things about his life that's supposed to inform what has come before but the stuff that has come before is so forgettable that it's like i was struggling to like make the connections that the author clearly wanted me to make with it Mm -hmm. um and i almost like i said i wish it was just more straightforward i don't i think the whole thing about uh him having this disorder that like he can't discern reality from this from his imagination i thought was just like useless i've got a condition i've got several conditions actually the most interesting one is this thing i got where my mind runs away with itself it's like daydreaming except it doesn't really go away when i want it to it lingers sometimes people call it a disorder but I'm a glass half full kind of guy, so I don't go in on that dime store wordage. Basically, I'm a daydreamer. But my daydreams tend to persist longer and more intensely than most people's do. At least, that's what I've been told by every doctor I've ever seen. The end result of it is that reality is a very fluid thing in my world. It's probably the reason I got into this whole writing thing to begin with. You could have done the same thing and just had him with a nagging conscience about mm-hmm. his own blackness and this story with this kid who's being shot. Everybody asking him, "What's the next story you're going to write, man?" 
Mm -hmm. while they have all the stuff going on in the background of people like encouraging him to write about black stories, other people telling him not to him having kind of a crisis of identity. Mm -hmm. And what does that mean? And how do I work through those things? And you could even end it in a similar way, except just do it straightforward where he's on a talk show and he ends up being on a panel with the mother of the kid that got shot. And that's the thing that he talks to her. It humanizes the experience. He thinks about his own life, his own traumas, because that's what the book is trying to do. It just right. does it with all of this extra shit that serves almost no fucking purpose. It didn't make it more engaging or interesting. Yeah, it, was just, it was just distracting. It felt filler. Um, it's all su- very superficial. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you had just done this way more straightforward, I think you actually just have a better story, in my opinion. You know? Sure, sure. Yeah. And, and, and I. Uh... I don't know, man. Like every, everyone's experiences are, you know, are different. And everyone's got different perceptions of, you know, their reality based on what they grow up, right? Like your buddy Tim Pool on the South Side of Chicago is going to have different perspective on a lot of certain lives than you know us in the sticks in New England, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. But I, I just, I, just a lot of it too. I just here, I just thought it's just like really topical with that, and I think it really relied and uh, and not to shit on like anyone's hard work and whatnot, but I think. It got all this praise because it was like it's so topical. If you sit down and like you were to break that out and try to abstract that from the novel and just try and look at what literary advisors are using, like what was what are the, like the themes here, like what was the story that they're trying to convey? What is it? Because that's what I after like listening to it uh, one and a half times uh, almost, you know, myself, like I still like you know. Right, you're struggling like with identity. You know, like, there's definitely it doesn't uh, end well. Not uh, everything has to end well. He even comments on it. You know. It's you know it's okay if nothing ends well, right? Um, nothing. Uh, what's the last chapter like? So everything's fixed, right? Like yeah. no, it's not. So it's just like where do you go? Like what is supposed to be the healthy like uh, take out of this? And I get now get it. And I'm not saying every story's got to have you know a positive message ending. Like, of course like not. That, but, like, but, but it should feel coherent. Like you should right, walk exactly. away like understanding what, what, what the thesis statement of the book is. And other than that, then like be your authentic self. Yeah. Because it's you know it's obviously about what is it like to be a black man in America through the prism of being a writer and that industry and the working in the arts and working in popular culture that you are somehow encouraged not to be black. Which I don't know if this guy maybe this guy's just not very familiar with pop culture from the past thirty years. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I mean, because dude, oh my god, there's even a reference. I mean, he just. That that the the first time they go through a, a I, maybe this is his age talking I don't know how old he is I think he's in his late thirties maybe in his forties mm. uh, there's a very when they have the BLM parade or parade <laughs> not a parade uh, uh, protest somebody's dressed up like characters from Do the Right Thing. Then come the boombox boys dressed in red, black, and green. Four of them. Late teen, muscle-bound fellows with radios on their shoulders and fight the power blaring from their boombox speakers, all of them wearing four-finger gold rings across their fists. L-O-V-E and H-A-T-E on one pair of black hands, G-E-T-M and O-N-E-Y on another, and the third somehow impossibly reads, See me as human, nigga. Mm. Uh, Radio Rahim. Radio Rahim's the character who walks around with a boombox, and he's got like these two, two yeah. knuckle knuckle rings that say uh, "love" and "hate." Those are in, in they're in the colors of the African flag. Right. Because he spends a lot of time just talking about the way they look. Yeah. And you're like, I get it, dude. I got it. Mm-hmm. I got it. <laughs> yeah. Like, you could have right. just said black, big black guys with a boombox, and I would have got it. Like you didn't have to go so far as to put them in the Radio Rahim costume. But that's just another thing about it, just being so surface level. Mm-hmm. It's such a surface level experience. Nothing is talked about in any, with any great depth. Like if you don't don't already agree with the sentiment, there is no argument made. Right. So you're just like, here's here's a statement. Right, here's right. a statement. Um, you 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 agree with? I don't have to push back on this at all, right? I don't have to get into the complicated nature of of any of this stuff. Right. Especially like there's a, if there was an opportunity to do it, it would have been with the cop who shot that kid. Mm-hmm. That conversation. Yeah. Actually have like a weird 
difficult, real conversation. Instead, it, the cop is just like the most stereotypical, angry, secretly angry white guy because he's supposed to represent the tone and tenor of the country mm -hmm. for white people. At least that's what it felt like. Yeah. Was I being personally attacked, Paul? Uh, I, I think you were. Oh my God! Well, I think I've never even been a cop. I've never even been a cop. You've been in the military. You should be feeling attacked, you piece of shit. <laughs> I think if you're feeling attacked, then hey. uh, this book yeah. was for you. <laughs> no, I just—I and... was just like—I was just kind of rolling my eyes and like, it starts off like it's gonna be like this interesting, maybe like uh, mm -hmm. conversation, maybe for the first time in the book, like they're gonna maybe get down to the meat of something, and it's just like, oh no, he's just an evil guy. He's just a bad guy, like. It yeah. doesn't try to represent the complicated nature of the people that get wrapped up in these things and being on either side of an event like that. Right. And what that could possibly mean and how complicated and weird and and how and the darkness of that for everybody involved. Right. It, it just the, um because like it's you could have had you had an opportunity to go into like really on like an action opportunity, like to make it like a, you know, Raiders like us or, you know, everybody like, you know, like uncomfortable or have like those conversations. Did you feel uncomfortable at all? Like as you're going through this? No. And not uncomfortable as like cringe, but just like the topic no, like, in yeah, general. Like, like it touched me in a way that I was like, oh, wow, that's maybe that's an interesting point. I never really thought of that. Yeah, like, or, no. Uh, inconvenient truth, some might say. Which, so any... listen, and in all, in full transparency, if it had, I would, I would admit it. I'm a very open, honest person. Like I, that's the whole point of doing these kind of things. That's the point of reading a book like this, or reading yeah. any book, or doing any of this stuff, or watching a movie, or listening to music. If it actually had affected me in that kind of way, I would totally be transparent about it. I have no problem like having this conversation, or learning more about it, or trying to be more empathetic to things well, that, that I don't. Well, that really in understand. essence, right, it's the goal is to evoke some type of emotion, right, and just so and just. I felt bad for Suit. I felt, but actually, I felt bad for Soot when his, when Tyrone was giving him a hard time. Yeah, that that sucked. That sucked. I felt bad for uh, Soot's dad when his grandfather couldn't let it fucking go. Mm -hmm. And that's just probably more for just personal life, my personal life. Yeah. You know, I, I've like you know, my father and my grandfather have had weird conversations like that in front of me when I was a kid. So mm -hmm. I was just like, oh, okay. <laughs> I, no, I connect with that. I connect yeah. with that. Me as a young uh, black identifying man. He black. Yeah. Well, you are in South Kakalaki. Well, that's well, one that's thing, true. too. It's like the uh, author, too. So, I mean, obviously, Stephen King always takes, you know, writes about, you know, being in New England and stuff like the characters based yeah, on I mean, there. Right? So yeah. it. But, I mean, this, I mean, this author is from Bolton, North Carolina. Um, which is in so the... Is, which is exactly where the narrative is from. Nestled in the sweaty armpit of Carolina swampland, Surrounded by gum trees and pines and cedars and oak and wild grapevines, the town of Bolton is the land that time forgot. Go back far enough into the town history, and there used to be a railroad stop and a sawmill here. And that was at its pinnacle, somewhere around 60 years ago or so. Back then, the town had a population of maybe around 3,000 people. The main exports of Bolton are lumber and black manual labor. The wood comes from the forests and swampland, all of which are owned by the local paper mill, and the labor comes from the town's 700-odd residents. I wish that I could tell you that something more than those two chief exports comes out of Bolton, but there's nothing else. Bolton isn't a town that gives, but neither is it a town that takes. It's the type of place that keeps to itself. It's self-sustaining, the way the past always is. And though it changes a little now and again, the way an old piece of metal seems to change colors over the years as some thin patina comes along and begins to grow over it, at its core, the town is the same that it has always been. And that's how the people like it. But apparently, now the town of Bolton has two new exports. Tragedy and a famous author. Mm -hmm. The author in the book, uh, you know, started writing at age 14, which Jason Mott, like, that's, that's when he started writing. Mm -hmm. You know, so, I mean, there's so many, you know, like, uh, things out there, too. So, like, it was going to be, like, I, I catch that part, like, he already had drafted with just the, the book tour stuff. 
Yeah. But, I mean, that makes sense because you want to do a loose thing about, you know, like, I, I get that. But I just think, I don't know. And it's also, maybe, it's, maybe, I mean, maybe this is, do you think it's maybe, is this something that he maybe struggled with as a person? Like being, like feeling not like an authentic black person? I don't know. Right. I mean, yeah, because it, that's, it, it, that's like, the whole, like when he get, comes back, he's at the end of the book tour, they're coming to Bolton. Mm-hmm. And they they basically have like a, a welcome home parade because he's like a local hero because he's mm-hmm. a famous author like from this very small town. But that that welcome home parade interrupts a BLM activist thing. Mm-hmm. As we turn down the main street leading into town, the young protesters begin to find themselves being supplanted by locals holding up signs that read, "Welcome home." And those that aren't holding up welcome home signs are holding up copies of Hell of a Book. Yeah. A BLM protest, and it takes it over, which, yeah. I, you know, is symbolic. Right. <laughs> For him being too, he, even he, he's in the way. Because he, yeah. can't, he can't just go out there and be with them, be with his people. Right. Yeah, he wouldn't be away, um, uh, in the way if he you know, wasn't awoke. Awoken, and so, and that's really at the end, like I don't know how they contrived, like you know, his arc, if you will, or whatnot. But I mean, it did. Uh, the one thing that frustrated me too, like, was I think all the the Kelly uh, scenes and like the whole thing with uh, the the uh, mortician. Like, I I didn't like. I, well, it doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't serve right. any purpose. Mm-hmm. I guess sure. it's it's there. So at the end of the book, he can be like, I should call her back. Right. Right. Um, what about the, uh, the it, chap- happen- it happens in the last third of the book. It's not even, or is it maybe a little more than halfway? Like yeah, about, about halfway. Her? Yeah. They start intertwining. Right. And so there's just, but it's it, very it, brief. It's, it's a very brief thing. And then he, he mentions like her trying to call him on the plane and he's like happy that he can't get in touch with her. Cause he's not so going to send her a text on a plane. That was like the chapter title. Like, you know, uh, yes. I miss you. A hell of a thing to say to somebody or something. So, yeah. Yeah, you know, but yeah, that didn't go anywhere, and I was like a little annoyed. Like after the fact of that, like what was that, or is that part of the the distraction of like following this guy that you're going to be just as aloof and haste as he is himself, right? Uh, just following that. So I I didn't know. What'd you think about the yeah the Nick Cage uh, airplane? Nope, nope, nope. I'm not going through this book to find this clip. You can imagine it though. Just listen to the words. Put it in your mind's eye. Just do it. It was another one of those things you're like, okay. It's a little cringy. A little a little cringe. It does seem like a Nick Cage thing to do though. To reach across the aisle and be like, I've read your book and here's where you went wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ever talk about this again. <laughs> yeah. He just came out of the movie. It's about it, like about him or whatever. Um, oh, it's coming out soon. It's about him like being himself. He stars mm-hmm. as himself. Yeah. Yeah, 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 but anyways, I I thought that I, like like I said, it was just for them. Like, okay, okay. I thought it was kind of fun. Um, how every time we referenced him, he used another one of his works, you know, and uh, <laughs> uh that was that was kind of funny. But uh, I mean, it's I, only it's but it's it's like is it it's not funny. It's just you're like oh, I recognize that. That's the joke. The joke is that you recognize it. It's yeah. not a joke. Well, it's well, not I a joke. This is like this is the evil. Remember? Do you remember? Do you remember uh, the fucking Nerdist? Remember like Chris Hardwick? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You ever watch At Midnight? Mm-hmm. Remember that that, yeah, that yeah, game yeah, show yeah, on Comedy yeah. Central? Yeah. This is the this is back. what they this is what they did to people. They think if you make a reference to a nerdy thing, that's all you got to do. Like, no, this is just like the time Chewbacca went through a went through a car wash, and everybody fucking just laughs. Mm. It's, the, it's the same type of shit. It's just like <laughs> fuck you. Like yeah, I get it. Okay, you know, so Chewbacca's wet. Right, oh, right, Nick, right. Nick, Nick Cage is like he's eccentric. Okay. Oh, so yeah, I recognize that movie. That's crazy. Mm-hmm. Oh, he asked this guy if uh, if he if he thinks there's Nick Cage marathons in heaven. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I got it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a very I'm a hateful person. So. Yeah. <laughs> I just don't just so many things didn't land. It felt like a lot of things just didn't connect. Things that were just filler and I don't know, man. Well, that's what it feels like. It feels like you feel like even in the moment sometimes like you're having your time wasted. Yeah. And you're like why 
especially after the fact, and especially it was even more egregious when I went through it again to get clips and stuff. Mm-hmm. But I was thinking about the parts when I like I took some notes and wanted to like get some parts, you know, to edit into the the podcast here. I was just like, so much of this is like to get to the moment that I was looking for. I'd have to sit through like four minutes of like nothing. Mm-hmm. No, just really, really descriptive in some uh, areas, incredibly vague in others, right? So, <laughs> but even descriptive, the stuff descriptive he, and non sequitur and vague in you know, substance. So, yeah, exa- I mean, exactly. He's very. He really hones in onto these non sequitur things that don't matter. The interior of Rennie's home is just as stunning as the exterior. Vaulted ceilings, marble tiles, a large kitchen counter that looks as though it was sculpted, not cut, but sculpted, from a single slab of marble. I feel like I've died and gone to capitalist heaven. And maybe I have. Other than I guess is is it is are those is that character stuff? Is that character building stuff? Right. Well, I think he seems pretty annoying. I don't know if I want to hang out with that guy. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, yeah. Seems like kind of a turd. Pretty much, man. Pretty much. But I was there any fuck, man. I think I already asked you this, so no I didn't. Was there anything that you liked about it? I mean listen. I'm not going to say this is apocalyptically bad. It's not even the worst book I've ever read. I wouldn't say that at all. I would give it a two out of five. Um, yeah. It wasn't like I, I didn't. I wasn't. I'm not like angry that I that I that I experienced it. I might be angry by the time I'm done editing this. <laughs> uh, But, like, I, I'm not, like, angry that I listen to it. I don't feel like I totally waste my time. Like I said, I don't read a lot of contemporary fiction. And it, it has actually made me curious about the quality of modern contemporary fiction. Well, I didn't go the uh, contemporary fiction route. Uh, my next download was uh, Beaten Black and Blue by the officer, Brandon Tatum. It's brought to you by Beating Black and Blue, Beating Black and Blue, being a black cop in America under siege. Make sure you get that book. It's available on Amazon. Also download the podcast, the Beat Tatum Show podcast. Link is in the description section. I think we got like twenty or 30,000 downloads at this point. So I appreciate everybody that have been supporting the podcast. Thank you. Did you didn't get the Norm MacDonald book? No, I got that. That's on there too. Oh yeah, you can't you can't listen to that one at, at uh, any weird speed though, because Norm Macdonald reads it. Oh yeah, no, I'm not going to fast forward Norm Macdonald. No, I mean I read it. I just read the oh yeah the Norm. It's it's norm. norm. I will not eat a single morsel of food until Margaret Thatcher is dead and buried. She died three weeks ago. Okay. <laughs> I actually have never listened to the audiobook. I got the audiobook like months ago because I want to revisit it, but I just read the book. And even when you read the book, you just hear his voice in your head and the mm. pace and the tone. Yeah, so yeah. It's, it's, it's really great. It's really great. It's like uh, his version of like uh, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, actually. Oh, I love it. I yeah. love it. Now I'm going gonna, gonna to knock that out. I'm going to knock that out, too. Well, dude, speaking of which, I'm trying a brand new rye tonight. Oh, what you got? Wheel horse. Oh, I've seen that. I've seen that around. Yeah. No, this is right up your alley. So you got that spice of the eye, but it really kicks like a bourbon. And uh, mm-hmm. it's still like 101 proof. 50.5%, man. Like, uh, it's good. And uh, under under 40 bucks. Mm. Under 40 bucks. So. This is key. Yeah, that's why I like the – I splurge the, the holidays. Every week I was just getting something I shouldn't have. And um, yeah. now I'm – now I'm going back to the, going back to the uh, the responsible shelf. Yeah, but dude, sometimes you like when you do that when you bust out that hundred bucks for a bottle and you're like, this is no better than that thirty dollar bottle, man. And it sucks. It's so that, such a bummer when that happens. That has not happened to me yet. I've never. It hasn't happened to you yet. On something where I didn't realize that, like, oh, that's good. It's happened to me twice. It's happened to me when I actually, well, you were there. I bought that hundred and twenty dollar bottle of Jameson. Oh. It felt like it was a complete waste of money. Like I just should have just bought a bottle of Jameson. Yeah. And then, um, what did I get? Oh, it was um, that that place from uh, Utah. Oh, it was High West. High West. Yeah. It was like the eighty dollar like. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Campfire yeah, rye, I think. Campfire one, yeah. It was okay. Like it wasn't. It wasn't. That much, uh, it was like it wasn't that much better than like the regular rye. Yeah, than their double rye. 
Yeah. Yeah, doing the double. Which rye. is my favorite know. of theirs right now that I've tried is probably the double rye. Mm. You tried their bourbon though, right? The, yeah, yeah, I've tried the yeah. bourbon. I've tried at least probably like four different variations of their stuff at this point. And it's actually that's a I I give those pretty high marks, the high west stuff. I yeah, really, no, it's, really it's, that it's stuff. quality, man. It's quality. But hey, I mean you make a solid under forty dollar bottle, you know. I'm I'm there. I'm there. I'm I'm there, man, buddy. I'll be your Huckleberry. Mm-hmm. I'll be I'm a Huckleberry. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I mean, like, I can't, I wouldn't recommend it, but you know, I could be wrong. You know, maybe I'm just too. Maybe I'm just. Maybe I'm just too much of a bigot or something. I don't know. Yeah. No, I'd, I'd love, to, I'd love to see a counterpoint. Um, to yeah, but know, actually you know. a real counterpoint, like a right. real conversation. Mm-hmm. Like the, all the reviews that I've seen about this, there is no. It is just as substanceless as the book. No, it just everybody. It just like, like you know what it is, man. This is just like, like a white guilt porn for fucking simping like white liberals, man. They're just like all yeah. over this dude's dick, and then virtually online texting it. Like, like Dude, one like of the funnest like, oh, things about this. This is so this. powerful. This is so the most powerful, powerful thing I've ever read. Yeah, <laughs> so, I, I sent you one where the guys like, it's, uh, you know, it's very although comical, it's very deep, but. <sighs> But I call it like you know the re- deep presence or something. Oh, dude! Like it's oh, I don't so think I, I don't think I sent it to you. No, I didn't. Uh, there was one. It was like uh, this guy's like this guy exudes like straight guy energy, and he's like oh, that made it only okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, here here we go. I got this. Is one of the ones I sent Paul earlier. This is from Goodreads, which is a good place if you want to go just get general overviews of uh-huh. reviews for books, the user reviews and stuff like that. This could probably be called the definitive book on Black Lives Matter. See, it gives the most incisive view of what it means to live in today's United States as a person of color through the eyes of both a man and a boy who may or may not be the same person. It doesn't matter how you interpret this. The important thing is you read it. Yeah. Well, we read it. We read it, man. Hey... <laughs> I, I'm st- it's still not going to. I mean, I'm going to continue my uh, Will of Fortune Audible. Will of Audible, if you will. I'm going to keep just, I, I, I'm begging you. Just like look up a fucking list of like the 100 greatest books ever read. And just go down that list. Stop this madness, Paul. You, uh, you uh, only have one life. You have one brain, dude. And you're burning brain cells every day. How oh, much longer man. are you going to be able to read books? Uh, well, you got like 10 more years before you're a puddle of slop. <laughs> Uh, hey man, fifty man. That, that's going to be a bitch. That's going to be Lucy, a bitch. Lucy, uh, Lucy gave it a rating of three. She said, "Well, there certainly were some wonderful things about this book, in particular the last section. But overall, mm-hmm. I think it needed a bit of editing, as it droned on a bit at times." Okay, surprisingly honest. She closes her review with, by saying, "And this is an older white woman's perspective." Oh, because that 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 matters. Got to qualify it, dude. You can't just like be out there writing reviews. Mm. Mm-mm-mm. So when you're reading that review, did you know it was a white woman writing? <laughs> I didn't actually, no. because she didn't have a picture next right. to the thing. Uh, so. David David also gave it three stars. He says, "Hell, the book is at times an astute depiction of the threat of state violence faced by black men in the United States." The novel is told in chapters that alternate between the perspectives of an unnamed author and an adolescent black boy called Soot. The chapters featuring Soot are excellent, although they are overshadowed by the main story following the author, which dominate the book. The main story is a bit tedious with, with too much silliness and a hefty dose of straight man energy. <laughs> the high points were very good, but getting there wasn't. What is straight man energy? Well, you see, he had a lot. Well, I would see, I would call it fuckboy energy. Okay. You know, the narrator story, that's a fuckboy. You know? Yeah. That's a fuckboy. That's a Matt Gates running around, <laughs> coming on everything. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Is this something you're going to uh, suggest to anybody? Maybe your sister, she might like it. Yeah, you know, my sister might like it, sister and brother in law. You know, might do that. They actually live somewhere, nowhere, Midwest, right? But, yeah. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll fire, fire it off to them. But <laughs> it, I, no, no, man. Um, I, I, I wouldn't recommend it to anybody. I think my wife might read it because it's on, you know, it's on Audible. Audible. Yeah, yeah. I already, I already downloaded that. But, um. <laughs> oh, hold on, you could maybe you could go get your credit back. Oh, dude, I, oh, after you told me that, 
after you told me that, I already I got three back. I couldn't part with Talon of God, though, but I got rid of a couple of others. I got rid of Talon of God. I said, be gone for my life, Talon. <laughs> no, I want a reminder of that, so that way I know to check for more fan fiction updates or if oh, no, that's true. another one's coming out. That's true. Because, like we said, when we did Talon Oh, dude, of God, that's what we got to do. That's like, you got to shoot me that fan fiction, so and we can review that in one of these times. Oh, man. Just that that, that was fun. That was fun. It that was, was a fun one. Yeah. But I just, I just another thing. I just wish, I uh, wish I had something you know more positive, Sam. Because now I'm feeling like how I felt like after I read this book. I was like, this was I was irritated and just uh, depressed uh, a bit, uh, not by the topical, but just as the overall delivery, the performance. Uh, well, it's you know. depressing that like the reaction of the, to this is kind of what depresses me because like are like this is the 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 like the definitive tome for this time period, like yeah. this ephemeral just kind of basic bitch like perspective on the world it's just it's not very mm-hmm. insightful or interesting even in any direction in any direction it's not that insightful right even say say what if say if this was like a written and he the narrator ends up being like a crazy militant person becomes really militant he joins the black panthers or something i'd probably have more respect for for it because <laughs> it it wouldn't be so milk toast or whatever. It's just like it's like somebody he had like a list of current events, what's going on around the world, like some topics. And it's like he's checking boxes. Yeah, and I hate that. And I really no, just like as deep and as deep as it got, it was just uh, referencing it, right? Yes. Like uh, especially the sad part was talking about like you know like so it's probably like you know I don't want to tell him you know I don't want uh, in relations to discovering about another shooting like you know why did that person get shot? What did they do? And it's like he's like, well, it's important we find out the facts and whatnot. And then the overall thing, like, you no, know, he doesn't want to tell them why. Like, and just this bullshit, like assumption, like it's all, like you know, just like there's no two sides of like of every story, and like you know, and just this negative lens, you know. And there's just like no appreciation of just like uh, how far you know it has come. Like, because mind you, this you know uh, black author in the novel is a bestseller and touring around the country. You know, so it's very terrible for him, but is he touring around the country because he, you know, uh, went to sleep, so to speak, in a you know, metaphorical sense with, you know, hiding it in based off, you know, Jack the Meteor's train. Cause they had that cringe part where he's talking to uh, like a uh, Renny, like I am black. And what do you think about it? State college. You're a writer. You're supposed to say something about these things and you're black. Am I? I ask. I look down at my arm and, sure enough, it turns out that Rennie is right. I'm black. A startling discovery to make this far along. Well now, I say, staring at the black hand at the end of my black arm and the black fingers adorning it. That's very, very interesting. He black. Am I? Because the first time he sees that BLM protest, right? And well, that's he what he said. He's like, he's like, this may seem like a startling revelation this far into a story, but yes, mm-hmm. I am in fact black. Mm-hmm. It was just like, re- really, man. And then he goes back. All right, let's pause for a minute. It's literally the ch- t- name, a uh, title of the next chapter following that, and yeah. it goes into where you get introduced to you know Jack the Media Trainer. So, and, and we talked about it earlier, but like that's what they do. I'm like, okay, don't write this. You know, book sells, blah blah blah. But and then. Then he goes in and takes on that, just like a Hunk, Humphrey Bogart character. Well, let's just fully go into that. Yeah. I don't just talk like him. Now I'm going to look like him to go back in life. I'm going to block everything out into a complete, complete haze until my own devices. And Well, you know, I, I think what you said, like saying uh, uh, that movie. What movie did you reference? Uh, uh, sorry to Bother You. Sorry to, bo- sorry to Bother You. I think that's like a good comparison or parallel. Well, I can acknowledge that I think Sorry to Bother You is like, well paced and it feels like you should be having fun it's a very mm-hmm. snappy movie i think it has an odious message um but like um the movie that movie is like a shitty song where you're like well it sounds awesome yeah but but this is but this is has a similar quality because it's yeah. just surface it's the mm-hmm. surface yeah it's the surf it's like uh, like a teenager's version like actually that's something i thought about when i was reading this or listening to it and I kind of cringed at myself a little bit. I was like, oh, I probably would have thought something like this idea for a story would have been very cool when I was 14. All right. 
oh, dude, yeah, he's crazy. He can't, like, differentiate between his, uh, his fantasy and reality. And uh, you see his dead kids, and they haunt him, and he's, he's getting drunk, and he's crazy all the time. Like, that's what you would have thought of maybe when you were 15 or 16, 14, thinking about what would be, like, a cool adult story. Right, right. <laughs> or probably because I saw Fight Club when I was 12. and How can I just rip off Fight Club? Yeah. Which, <laughs> which there's nothing wrong with, like, ripping off people you love. You know, so flattery, flattery's best imitation. Yeah, of the sure. Power, but, yeah, but yeah, you know, nice if you but, do it well. Yeah, but nice that's the thing. Well. That's, that's the thing. You're going to rip me off. You know, do it. Do a good job with it. You know, do a good job with it, so that way I can see your ass. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah. dude, I I had uh, I, I'm never going to not do do a Wheel of Audible again. And uh, I was as soon as I did it, it just it just popped in my head, man. So it was just like I was talking about something else, uh, another topic, and I was just I was just going to shoot. You could have said no, man. Okay, then I would have went on to and I would have been on the mic. No, I actually I know in in its own weird way, like I do appreciate it because it does it expands your horizons. Like you see a little bit what's out there. Mm-hmm. There are lots of times I feel very out of touch with contemporary culture. Yeah, uh, I don't watch a lot of like new TV shows or anything right. like that. So I'm like really out of the loop with a lot of stuff. And honestly, it was just kind of interesting to read something that would be considered in the modern purview, like a, oh, this is a great book. This right. Like an important smash hit. Right, right. Which I don't know. I wonder what the book sales are like for this. I don't know. But I don't know. It's got a lot of reviews. It's got 933 written reviews, 5,497 ratings. And Goodreads, I believe, is connected to Amazon. So these are probably Amazon purchasers. And they're the biggest seller of books in the country. Mm-hmm. I don't even know what's considered like a smash book these days. I mean, neither. No, like, unless, you're some, unless you're somebody like Jordan Peterson or something where you have like this huge international crossover and you sell, you know, 50 million books or something. Right. That's, in most authors that like make a living, they sell like 20 to 50,000 copies of their books. They don't sell like a ton of ton of ton of copies. Yeah. Well, but anyways, man, I'm glad I'm glad you read it with me. <laughs> well, you know, I'm I'm glad you suggested it. It was a fun conversation. Um, here's the soot. Soot. Uh, Nick Mason. Cage. Here's Nick Cage. Here's the Nick Cage. Uh, may he live on in eternity in uh, the narrator's second book. There we go. That we won't read. <laughs> uh, anyways, all right, thanks, Paul. I appreciate it, buddy. Oh, thank you, buddy. Uh, and thank you all out there for listening, for watching, all that good stuff. There's a bunch of stuff in the description. If you want to go check it out there, you are more than welcome to. Um, this has been Zoobox Goes to the Library. Thanks for joining us. And we'll see you next time. Who knows what we'll talk about next time. Who knows what the Wheel of Audible will present to us. (laughs) Sick fuck. All of the greatest works of art. The greatest literature known to man at his fingertips at any given time. And he's over there randomly scrolling like a psycho because it gets him off. Because it gets him off. The road less traveled, good buddy. It gets this guy off. He's Mm -hmm. sick. He needs the excitement. Who doesn't, man? Who doesn't? (laughs) <laughs> it spiced up your life. Yeah, that's true. It spiced up your life. Hell of a book, man. Hell of a book. Good night, everybody. He black.